comes with the word of his song. Let's stand and sing hymn 338, How Firm a Foundation. Thank you. 
one at Elizabeth Butch Funeral. We heard one testimony from Elizabeth this morning uh, about her summer league experience, but today we're going to hear a little bit more about her, uh, her background. Um, so, uh, Elizabeth, first of all, tell us where you're from, tell us a little bit about your family. Uh, I'm from Blythe, South Carolina, which is about an hour south of here in Columbia. Uh, I have a brother who is 23 now, and a sister who is a senior in high school, so, um, and mom and dad. So, who are you studying with her? Um, I met with her from a senior, I'm studying middle school education. Uh, so, how did you become a Christian? How did they call you to the same? Um, I think, I would say I became a Christian uh, in sixth grade through, uh, I went on a retreat with my church back home. Um, and based on the sermon and everything that I heard that weekend, um, actually in Asheville at Kansas City Club, um, I would say I was saved then. Um, but I didn't truly start really following God until I was in Camp Winthrop and I started coming to the college Bible study and then to the park. So I really kind of would say that. Yeah, so how did God bring you to uh, uh, church? So uh, Sarah Servants, um, I met her when I moved in as a freshman. Um, and through some connections that she had, she introduced me to John and Tom, um, and he invited both of us to uh, the Bible study that Pastor Dave was leading at the time, um, which was at Casey Essex House. And so that was kind of the beginning. I think I'd already been searching for our church, um, but after I got involved with all the college students there, I really felt connected and started coming to Clark probably a month or two after that, and then joined the following spring. Oh, three and a half years. Yeah. I remember when she first came, she came on a Wednesday night. I remember uh, Ellen and uh, Jenny um, looking at each other after the service and going, those poor girls are never coming back. Three years later. Um, well, how has God used this church uh, to encourage you all to do? Yeah, God used y'all in like a really, really powerful way in my life. So I don't even know what I would that. I guess. Um, well, keeping me accountable, so having college students who are really dedicated um, to loving the Lord and showing me how that really does look, um, and so showing me how important the local body is and how that should be my first priority, even though I'm a college student and even though school does play a really important role in my life, um, that God should be first um, and that the local body is the avenue I can use to I guess. Um, and so just through that, through the Bible study is really teaching me solid theology and um, showing me how beautiful a church body can look and how every generation is important in that church body. Um, gotcha. And then just really just loving me. So many families here have fed me, um, important to me, and helped me, and just gosh, it's amazing. Well, uh, what, what are ways we can pray for you? Um, I am currently doing my state teaching at a middle school in Clover, um, sixth grade math, and it's been really cool so far. Um, but there's been a lot of, a lot of emotional burden, I guess, that I've had to deal with um, with the students, a lot of things going on in their lives, um, a lot of stuff going on in my life, and trying to balance church, school, internship, all that kind of stuff. So prayers that um, I stay focused on that, but that it doesn't become so overwhelming that I can do it, um, and also. Prayers for um, all the girls that I'm moving with, and then also some girls. Uh, I'm waiting for Bible study for DCM, my house group, and some first Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Elizabeth and uh, what she means to this church family. We thank you so much for how she serves and her gifts to our, our congregation. God, we pray that you would continue to use her to, and to bring joy and light to our people. We pray, God, that we would continue to love her well. Father, we pray specifically for her needs. We, we ask that you would just give her wisdom and how to live out and, and be faithful to you in the midst of um, a busy internship and school and church and all the different responsibilities that she has. Father, we pray that you give her perseverance to press on uh, to the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We pray that you give her um, wisdom as she speaks into these uh, middle schoolers' lives, Father, and the truth. We pray, God, also for the girls that she's discipling at BCM. We thank you so much for her ministry and for that opportunity. God, we pray that you would just help her uh, teach people the scriptures as she has been taught uh, faithfully. Uh, so, Father, we uh, thank you so much for the house that she's in. And we ask God that you would just give her and those uh, girls um, uh, a season of peace and harmony uh, and help them grow in peace. 
Father, we, we love Elizabeth. We pray, God, that you allow her to feel the Holy Spirit and to walk faith. I grow her to be more to maturity in Christ. In Jesus' name. Well, now we have the great privilege uh, of hearing God's word. Uh, over the next uh, several uh, weeks, we're going to be hearing from uh, our elders. Uh, our elders are going to be uh, bringing God's word to us, uh, as well as some of our uh, interns uh, this year. So, uh, encourage uh, that Pastor Gary Helson is going to come and bring uh, the word of life uh, to us. Um, before we, we go, I'm just going to pray uh, for him and hand him. Father, I thank you so much for this day and uh, for the great privilege of hearing your word. We know that it is uh, a greater gift that you, the creator of the universe, would speak. <clears throat> God, we pray that you be with uh, Gary, Pastor Gary. We thank you so much for his, his life and his ministry, his absolute love for the word of God. We pray that you would allow him to speak clearly, uh, speak powerfully, God, and that we would grow in this. Uh, bless our time now. Luke 14, Luke 14. I was talking to uh, Brian this morning, and he said to me, you have new glasses, right? And I said, well, it's kind of glasses in my I I have had, uh, only the Lord knows how many of the glasses I've had. The last couple of years, I, I just have to say to keep them. I'll lose them. I'll leave them to different places. There was, uh, a few weeks ago, I, I got dressed to church and put a pair, not this pair, in my coat pocket. And somewhere between there and here, they disappeared. I was over at Frank and Betty's house, and we had a study there uh, over a year ago, I did. And, uh, Somewhere between starting the Bible study and ending it, the glasses. <laughs> so I'm Luke 14, uh, there's much in this passage. We're just going to look at, uh, at the parable of the banquet. And we're going to start in about verse 15. Uh, something should clue you in all the time when you're reading the Bible, especially in the New Testament. Anytime the Lord Jesus asks a question, pay attention. Anytime he starts a conversation like this, he's going to tell a story. Well, in those stories, he's not just talking to uh, have conversation with somebody. It's always about the gospel. I want to read a couple things, too, that I read the other day from uh, professor uh, Dennis Johnson. He's a professor of practical theology at Westminster Seminary in California. And he said this. He said, <clears throat> Biblical history is not just a record of dry facts, but it's a recital of events that call us to trust and obey the God who saves in time and space. And time and space is when God's plans are carried out. One thing he was doing before creation was he, he made his plans from beginning to end. And all of history is pointing towards that day that the Lord talks about in this passage in Scripture. All of history is pointing to the day that you and I and all these uh, biblical characters and all the, the great uh, preachers and men and uh, women uh, of uh, church history will sit down and have an incredible banquet with the Lord of Lord and the King of Kings. I'd like for just us to just uh, look at this passage and uh, Revelation 19, beginning in verse 6. It says, then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of many peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. 
For the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. For I am a fellow servant uh, with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus, worship God for the testimony of Jesus, is the spirit of prophecy. Always pay attention to who's speaking uh, when you read uh, the New Testament, when you read any parts of the Bible. So in verse 15, it says, one of those who reclined at table with heard these things that he had just said in verses 12 through 14. He said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your, or your relatives or rich neighbors, but uh, lest uh, they also invite you in return, and you may repay. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the couple, the land, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the judge. The Lord is obviously, and he's going to tell this, this uh, parable, this story, and it is, a, uh, it is a hyperbole, which is a highly exaggerated uh, way to uh, get his point across. And look what, he's, uh, what, what, what happens in verse 15. It says, but one of those who reclined at table with him heard these things, and he said, blessed is anyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Now that sounds like a wonderful thing to say to the Lord, doesn't it? But do you know who this man is that's saying this? He's the, uh, look back over in uh, uh, the very first part of uh, chapter 14. It says, uh, one Sabbath when he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, this guy's not only a Pharisee, he's a ruler of the Pharisee. They were watching him carefully. Why do you think they were watching him carefully? Because on purpose, he was healing people on the Sabbath. And to the and to that to that mindset, to that Pharisee mindset, you can't do anything on the Sabbath. And the Lord takes him to task of that. And time and time again, he was showing that. It's not outward stuff. You see, the, the main issue with this Pharisee is the same issue with every Pharisee. They were self-righteous. They thought they were serving God. They thought they, they loved the God of the Bible, but Jesus Christ comes on the and shows who he is, and he reveals their heart, and we find out that they were very far, very, very far, from the Lord. Uh, remember in uh, Luke 18 10, when a Pharisee uh, and a tax collector go up to the temple to pray. And the Pharisee prayed and said, Oh Lord, I thank you. I'm not like a man. I'm not an extortioner. I don't do this and I don't do that. And then the, the tax collector was over in the corner and he just smote his breast. He said, He wasn't worthy to look up in the heaven. He said, Lord, forgive me my sins. And the Lord said, This man, went away justified. So what we're going to see is the Lord is talking about in this parable, he's talking about salvation. The banquet is salvation. Here, this man is giving this incredible banquet. Who is the man? Well, we can see the man is God himself. God's giving this great banquet and he's inviting all these people to come. And since we have to ask this question as well. Uh, look at verse 16. But he said to him, this is Jesus talking. I got to thinking a while ago. The, the uh, eternal Son of God comes to earth and he speaks to people. He gave this parable 2,000 years. 
My job, my responsibility, is to take what the Lord said and share it, where you and I can see ourselves in this parable. We always, all, all the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the book of Acts, is a narrative. We can see ourselves in this parable. If we can read this and not see ourselves somewhere in it, we're not connected with the scriptures. Uh, so, look what happens here. But he said to him, a man wants to have a great banquet and invited many. Lloyd Jones, uh, William last week quoted Lloyd Jones a few times, so I thought, aha, that gives me an opportunity to latch in to be a good doctor. My life was revolutionized reading his uh, biography and, and reading his sermons and uh, just how the Lord rightly, rightly used that man. So always ask questions when you read the Bible. Always ask questions. Who is this servant? Who is, who are the people that's invited? Well, if we look at the scripture, I think we can find out who was uh, who was invited uh, very, very quickly. The book of Romans, a passage of scripture that, of course, we all know, says this. Paul said that, uh, Paul said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Then what's the next words? To the Jew first, and also to the Greek. The Lord determined that he was going to start a nation. And he did with a moon worshiper named Abraham. Or Abel, name changed to Abraham. Sarah. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What about, um, what about another passage of scripture? A verse of scripture that God done. The Bible in John 1, verse 11 says, he, speaking of Jesus Christ, he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, once again, if we look in the same book of the Bible, over in John chapter 8, this is one of the longest narratives, I think, in the book of John, when the Lord's talking to these Pharisees when he's explaining to them, talking to them, uh, talking to them. Look in uh, chapter 8, we we'll only have time to look at a few verses, but in chapter 8, verse 39, do we have to wonder why the Pharisees hated him? Uh, look what he says in verse 39 of chapter 8. Uh, they said, Abraham's our father. And Jesus said to, uh, said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You're doing the works of your father, that your father did. They said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality. What about the accused him of? They accused him of being illegitimate. They said, we have one father, even God. Jesus said to him, if God were your father, you would love me. I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I'm saying? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's will. He was a murderer from the beginning and doesn't stand in the truth because there's no truth in it. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for well, he's a liar and a father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, you won't believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? I tell you the truth, uh, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. The Jews answer. Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan? You have a demon. Now they're accusing him of being demon possessed. 
eternally God himself. The Lord said, I do not have a demon, but I honor my Father, and he dishonored me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, and uh, as did the prophets. And you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? Go all the way down to uh, verse 58. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So the man who's giving the toast to start out this parable, he says, uh, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. He, he has a goblet of new wine, and he's looking at the feast, and he's just full of self-pride. He's full of self-righteousness, and that's when the Lord steps in with the story. He says, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many, and at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to invitations. They already have an invitation. He sends another group to make sure they receive the invitation. Uh, and he said, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. And they gave some of the silliest, goofiest excuses you could ever imagine. The first said to them, I, well, I'm on field, and I'll just go out and see it. Please have me an excuse. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. Please have me an excuse. And another said, well, you know, I got married and a wife, and therefore I can't come. So the servant came and reported these things to the master, and the master of the house became angry. He said, to him, go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And the servant said, sir, what you have commanded has been done, and they are still will. And the master said to the servant, well, go out to the highways, hedges, and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. That ends the parable. It doesn't end the chapter. There's one verse left, and I'll close with that in a little bit. The parable's ended. And uh, we see who the servant is. The servant in chapter 2 of the book of Acts, chapter 2, uh, in verse. Uh, 13 says, says this. <clears throat> I'm sorry, Acts 2, 26. It's talking about him being a servant. Acts 2, 13. For some reason I don't have that. But he's called a servant there. Can anybody shout out that verse to me? I'm sorry, it's 313. I found it. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, congregation. You're out. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our Father, glorified his servant Jesus. Jesus is the Father's servant while he is here on earth. Then in verse 26 of uh, chapter 3, it says this, God having raised up his servant, sent him to you first, sent him to the Jews first, to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. So, the servant, servant is said, only two other times in the New Testament is the word servant for Christ used by the Acts 4 in Matthew 12. Um, R.C. Sproul said there are going to be two kinds of people in heaven. Those that despise God, hate him, uh, mock him, have always hated him on this earth, and they'll never change when they go off into the uh, awful place called hell. And then there's going to be a group of people that are there that are shocked to their toes because they're there. Remember the passages in Scripture where the Lord died, uh, where the people say, Lord, didn't we do my Beads in your name, cast out demons in your name, Lord. Didn't, don't you remember us? And the Lord says, 
I never, never knew. And the reality, the fact is, that anybody that's self-righteous doesn't need a Savior. It's hard to witness to somebody that doesn't need a Savior. They see no need of Christ. They see no need of their own sin. That's where the rest of this parable is going to, to take up, and I think the Lord uh, will show us this. There's a, uh, a quote by this, uh, by this person that I wanted to, uh, to relate to you. It's a professor from Westminster. He said this. He said, the key to any parable is the unexpected element that shows us to be guiltier than we have ever guessed. And it will show us grace to be greater than we have ever dreamed. And that's what we will see in this parable. Um, John MacArthur made a, uh, a comment that, uh, that I thought was worth writing down. He said, to expect heaven with, uh, uh, while rejecting Jesus Christ is the most deadliest sins of all. People think that uh, uh, they'll talk about God and they'll mention God or say something, but if they never put a name to that God, then uh, I'm afraid they probably don't go anywhere at all. We got to realize the rejection of the Jews was not all of Jews. That was mainly in southern Judea, in southern Judah, were the ones that rejected him in, north, uh, in the north in Galilee, except for a few rare times, he was pretty well accepted. So there's always been a remnant of Jews. Today, there are some Jews that believe, not many, some, um, not all, of course. Uh, in verses 18 through 20, I think we just read that, we, uh, we've seen the ones that... Uh, uh, that have that have all these excuses. Romans chapter eleven and verse twenty-five and verse twenty-six. And I certainly won't have time to uh, read any of the notes, but if you have an ESV study Bible and the notes in the ESV study Bible on Romans eleven uh, twenty-five and twenty-six are really good, and that explains it real well. Paul's talking about. Right in Romans 11, 25, and he says, Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brother. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come. And in this way, all Israel will be saved, as it is written. And the liberal will come from Zion to banish ungodliness from Jacob, and this will be my coming with them when I take away their sins. Uh, I want us to look for, for just a minute of, of, of who the Lord said to invite. You see, there's this great feast, this incredible feast that is uh, taking place. And so it's not failed. People are giving excuses for not coming. So at first, uh, at, 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 at first uh, in verse 21, he's called the master of the house. He says, go out. From here, then go out to the streets and lanes, go out a little bit and find some people to come in. And then he says, Well, Lord, I've done that, and they still won't come. Then he, he goes to the outreach. He, he says, Go into the, into the highways and hedges, then just go out and find people, compel them to come in. I was talking to Grant yesterday uh, about a person that we knew here for quite some time, Sam. Sam was in some, some trouble. And uh, out in the morning center last year, uh, Grant said there was a room there that several of the guys would sit in. And Grant said, they, said we just got to call it the dark room because he said you could walk in there and almost feel the coldness and the ice and the spiritual depression, oppression of the place. And Sam was one of those people that, uh, that was with that group. Grant said he tried to talk to me right at first, and he, he didn't want to play the little bit. You know, just very cold, very indifferent. And so the word compel it doesn't mean Grant didn't take him by the collars and push him against the wall and say, You will listen to me. That's not what we're talking about. But over, you know what our warfare is? Our warfare is not hard. Our warfare is prayer and uh, the truth of the word of God. 
And so Grant prayed, and a lot of us prayed with him. Long story short, after a year, we know we got a person that had changed, that we saw Sam a different person. He told Pastor David and I, he said, I have never had anybody to love me. He said, from the time I was a child, I was in the wrong group, the wrong crowd, always doing the wrong thing. I never had anybody to direct me and show me and help me. So uh, uh, that's a real, it was a real privilege to get to know Sam. He, he told us on the way back, Pastor David was in the back and I was driving. He was sitting over there one of the days that we met. They, the, the, the trial didn't go on. They held it till the next day. And Sam said, you know, I don't know the Bible, and I don't know any Bible verses. Uh, he said, but, but I often go down to the lock down, down there, and I tell those people that they're strung out on drugs, they're sleeping in the streets, and, and he said, uh, uh, drinking heavily and all that. And he said, I tell them, you know, you guys don't have to do this. He said, come to church. He said, our church loves those people. and loves people like this. He said, they love me. And they said the same thing that uh, you would think they'd say. They said, Sam, are you going crazy? Because Sam was one of them. He lived like they did. But then the Lord changed his heart. The Lord came into his life. And that's what the Lord's talking about when he's looking at this. The Pharisee had self-righteousness. He didn't need Christ. He didn't need God. He didn't need anything. The very fact that he was born a Jew. The very fact of his heritage, he thought was going to get him there. But then look what the Lord says here. And I think we can unpack very simply uh, uh, what this is here. The Lord says, go out into the streets and the lands of the city and bring in the poor. What is the first, uh, for the Lord's preaching, the great sermon on the mount, the first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit. Such is the kingdom of God. Folks, if you don't see yourself poor, if you don't see yourself bankrupt, then you're self righteous. Huh. How much money would it take to buy salvation? The very fact, think about this, the very fact that the eternal God was planned. And the eternal God, uh, Jesus Christ, second person of the Godhead, accepted the invitation to come to this earth and to be hung on the worst form of death ever defined. And he did that. The very fact that he came and that he died, that he was buried and that he rose is proof positive that there's no way that we could ever earn our way to heaven. It's absolutely impossible. So the poor, the blind, the crippled, the blind. Remember the story where the man born blind and the Lord Jesus spits in the ground and he makes some mud and puts, puts it on his eyes? I believe with all my heart that Jesus Christ made eyeballs. You say, how do you do that? Well, how do you make man? How to create the world, how to create the universe. I believe he created those eyes. And some four times the Sanhedrin bring in on one of those. How did this happen? Did they bring his parents in on the eyes on, 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 on the deal? They were afraid of the Sanhedrin, so they said he was a to ask him how he did. So bottom line, the man said this: All I know is I was blind. Now I can see. And he didn't even have to have any of these glasses. We are poor. We are lame. How many lame people did the, did the Lord heal? Spiritually speaking, has anybody ever wailed and picked themselves up by their blue stripe, uh, blue straps? And become a believer. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The scripture says that we're dead in our sins. What can a dead person do? We can't work ourselves. There's nothing. 
Have you ever heard of the noetic effect? That means every facet of the human being has been affected by something. Our thinking process, our reasoning ability, uh, physically, mentally, emotionally, everything has been affected. I read this quote not long ago. For a guy who wrote it, I should take credit for it. Huh? It says this. It says that man will never gravitate to a system that condemns him. Do you think this Pharisee is gravitating to Jesus? Not hardly. So we are, we're absolutely uh, poor, we're crippled, we're blind, we're lame. There's nothing in ourselves that can reach out to God. That's what Christ is telling us. That's what he's saying. That's the condition of man. Look at the grace that God got into us. The quote, Lord Jones again, he said, a person needs to understand two things. How, number one, how destitute we really are. I had no idea how lost I was until Christ came into my life and Christians came into my life and I started reading the Bible and people shared Christ with me. And, I, and as I was growing, as I was growing in Christ, seeing that God was so gracious and so so kind to me, uh, Christ coming on the cross. The Bible says that, that he did two things when he died on the cross. He saved us from himself, and he saved us from ourselves. So that we're not alone, we self-destruct. First John 3 8 says that the Lord came to destroy the works of the how does he destroy the works of the devil? Oh, it reached, it reached the zenith, did it not, on that third day? On that third day when they thought it was all lost, and he rose from the dead, not spiritually as the uh, non-believers would say, but he bodily rose from the grave. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over, over his foes, as, as they tell us when we sing that song. Another thing a person needs to understand is how destitute we are. A person needs to understand how rich God is. He's full of, uh, full of grace, full of mercy, full of love, full of forgiveness. What if he just forgave us? Wouldn't that be enough? But he not only forgave us, but he redeemed us, which means he bought us back from the slave market. We were owned by Satan when we came to this earth. And until we receive Christ, until he comes in my comes into our heart, then we belong to God. Then we can serve God because, uh, uh, because he has redeemed us. So he has redeemed us, and boy, that would certainly be enough, wouldn't it? We're going to pass on one of these days, and we're going to go on to glory, we're going to be with him and his kingdom forever. But the Lord knows another thing. Not only did he forgive us and redeem us, he adopted us. We now his children. I'm his son. You're his son. You're his daughter. But we're not just citizens. We're part of a family now. We're not angels. We are higher than angels. Angels are not part of God's family. They're his, they are his creation. One of the great verses in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the life of <laughs> Romans chapter 4. There's a word, logizomai, which means to credit to another's account. Romans chapter 4. That word is used some 10 or 11 times in the book of Romans. It's talking about Abraham. In verse 2, Romans 4, for if Abraham was justified by the works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was uh, Rogizomites to him. It was credited to him. And it goes all the way down through the scripture. It says that many times in verse 22. It says that is why his faith was counted. It was the, the old translation, you might have a word reckoned. It was counted, it was put on his account. But the words, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone, but for ours. 
And you enter the narrative yet? I have been forgiven because it's been given to my life. The forgiveness for, for uh, it will be counted to us also who believe in him who was raised from the dead, Jesus the Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses, for our trespasses, and raised for our justification. He's been raised, he's he's justified. We're, we're justified, our sins are gone in our sins. So he's told them to go to the deeper riffraff, go to the pool halls and the the bars, any place that you can find anybody. And he's talking about that spiritually. Uh, Matthew 21, 31. How do you think this, how do you think these Pharisees liked hearing this? Can you see why the Lord Jesus was never uh, rabbi of the month? According to them, look at Matthew 21, 31. Here these people are. They thought they were the most holy, most special people on the earth. They despised anybody that wasn't like them. They were the witness nation. They were supposed to be the witness nation. Instead, they became, become, they hated anybody that like them. That's why the Lord tells the great parable. Uh, the good Samaritan, who was the one that did the work of the Lord? It was the Samaritan. Jews despise. I want you to look at this verse of scripture. And I'm sure after this, he uh, was not very well thought of as if he was at any time. Matthew 21. Uh, about verse, the parable of the tenants. Verse 34. When the season for the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, beat one, and saw another. Again, he sent out the servants more than the first. I'm sorry I've gone down too far. Let's go back up a little bit. Verse 28. What do you think? A man had two sons, and went for the first and said, Sons, I went to work in the vineyard. And the answer, I will not. And afterward, he changed his mind and went. And he went to the other uh, son and said to him, and he answered, Sir, I'll go, uh, but he didn't go. Which of the two did the will of the Father? And they said, The first. And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, tax collectors and prostitutes. What? He says, Tax collectors and prostitutes go into the kingdom of God. And they will be there. He's talking to me. Self righteous Pharisee on that deal in that situation. Um, so the Lord sent the gospel to the Jew first. Um, they refused. They sent the servant. They didn't want the servant. The remnant Jews and the Gentiles mostly composed the true church of Israel, which now is the church. We are the poor. We are the poor. We are the blind. We are the homeless. Well, now the parable's over. But don't close your Bible yet. Because Jesus stops telling the parable and then he says to them the same thing he told over in uh, Luke 18 when he's telling that parable. And I'm sure here in the In 18, when he's telling about the Pharisee and the tax collector, uh, look what he says in verse 14. He says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified. So Jesus is having authority to justify people? Uh, yeah, I think we can say that. And to close this section of scripture out, he says the same thing. He says, for I tell you, remember now the parable's over. He says, I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste mine. So, uh, the, the self-righteous are not going to go. Those that are humble and invite Christ into their life. Remember the beautiful, to me, is the, one of the great <coughs> illustrations of the gospel about uh, human responsibility and uh, the sovereignty of God. There's a man with a withered hand. His hand's withered. He can't use it anymore. It doesn't say which hand it is. Just say it's the right hand. His hand's withered. 
And the Lord says to him, stretch out your hand. And as he stretches it out, as he obeys the Lord's word, as he stretches it out, it's made. Come unto me, all of you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. As you come, as a person comes, they're healed. He reaches out, he touches, and begins a work. In the person's life. To refuse the father's offer of, of his son is a damning decision. Glenn Shunk, pastor, or he was an evangelist, 44 years ago this past June, he walked the pastor's study that showed the Bible, the, the doors were on the inside. He walked out the door, walked up to the pulpit, and said, good people don't go to heaven, and bad people don't go to heaven. I was sitting about second row in that church, and I had been to the church in a lot of years. I was far from the Lord. But he said those words, and I've never been the same since. That started a domino chain reaction of God working working in my heart. I didn't understand all that he meant when he said those words, but it certainly arrested my attention. Now I know what he meant. He meant that there's no one particular sin, but somebody did a sin, so therefore they're going to hell, or a person is a good person, does good works, and he does good things. That's no indication you're going to hell. It takes the new birth, it takes the work of God, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Wind, the Holy Breath to come into our life and change us and give us purpose and direction in our lives. Let us pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you, dear Lord, that even though I may forget passages and ramble through it from time to time and not say exactly to what I plan on saying. Dear Father, I am so glad that you are the Holy One of Israel. I am so glad that you redeemed my heart. I am so glad. I am so, so proud in a godly way to be part of this church. I thank you, dear Lord. We live in a time when, Lord, 44 years ago, I didn't know one church from the other. I didn't know a good church from a bad church, but I do now, Lord. And I know that you are using the folks in this church to do a wonderful work for you. God, may we, don't let us, Lord, take for granted. Don't let us take for granted, Pastor Dave, and the other families and, and people that's been in this church um, for many years, Lord. We love you and we appreciate you. We just pray, dear God, that we would honor you with our lives. We pray for one another tonight, Lord. We thank you for the cross. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing hymn 546 as our closing song. We'll sing the first and second verse of 546. Love me. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within. Sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now saved am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When Ever 
His praises sing. Love so mighty and so true merits my soul's best songs. Faithful, loving service to, to Him belongs. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. Nothing else could.